I'd like to begin our meeting today in much the same way I did our class, um, both last quarter and, and this quarter, uh, with a quote familiar to our students, a clarion call of sorts um, from one of my personal heroes, the oceanographer, Sylvia Earle. She says, in the next 10 years, or the next 10 years will be the most important in the next 10,000 years in terms of shaping the future where humans can have a hope for an enduring place within the natural systems that keep us alive, end quote. So you've heard me say that your generation is among the most consequential, most consequential in the history of humanity. You will be the change makers, changing hearts and minds through extended reality, changing policy through good science and good science communication, changing the way we collect data, the way we take the pulse of our planet. And in the midst of climate change, you can change the climate, the climate of discourse and dialogue. So let's begin. Um, I will go ahead and introduce our first two presenters. Um, it'll be our team with Casey Toy and Chloe Lee. So we'll turn it over to you. Feel free to share your screen. Um, for your presentation, Casey and Chloe, you have 10 minutes. Thank you, Professor. Um, so we're going to get started. Casey, do you think do you want to start sharing? Can everyone see it all right? Yes. OK, cool. So hi, guys. My name is Chloe. Um, hi, I'm Casey. And um, we're just going to be presenting one part of our XORXR project. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is an overview of what we're gonna talk about today. So first we're gonna um, talk a little bit about research that we conducted on San Diego residents. Um, then we're gonna dive into Angel and Zongzi's part of the VR simulation um, and conclude with what this means for us moving forward and how this ties into our theme of a changing planet. Next slide. Okay, so to introduce our project, um, so we wanted to talk about um, how people in San Diego, we live right next to the ocean, right? So it's going to be um, a little difficult to um, kind of ignore like the big overarching theme of climate change since it's such a prevalent topic to all walks of life. But we wanted to research more into what San Diego residents believe about um, living near the ocean to begin with. So since we're living near the ocean, we're obviously more at risk of an, a water-based natural disaster. But usually when people think about living in San Diego, they think about the good weather or how accessible the beach is or good how good seafood is. Um, and floods are kind of the least of our worries, which leads our team to wonder how might we find an effective way to raise flooding awareness in San Diego. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. Um, so we researched a number of San Diego County residents and we wanted to find out um, a little bit more about their perspectives. So some of the questions we asked were, what are the cons are li of living in San Diego County? Um, this is pretty much to gauge um, what the downsides are of living in San Diego while also trying to gauge their thoughts of the future of this county when we asked how likely it is, do you think that San Diego will experience flooding in the next 10 years? Next slide, please. Um, yeah, so our survey generated um, a pretty surprising conclusion. 60% of people mentioned how they fear flooding while living in San Diego County, while 90% of people responded uh, higher than a six when they were asked on a scale of one to 10, how likely do you think it is for a flood to occur within the next 10 to 15 years? Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so these are just a couple of quotes from people that actually responded to our survey. One male said that for certain low-lying areas, people may need to eventually relocate altogether. Um, another student, female student, said that floods can impact her living situation and even endanger her life. And another young man stated that all his possessions could be lost. Um, and with this, we kind of concluded that people are definitely scared of their lives being in danger. And although flooding isn't exactly at the top of their minds and not their highest priority, when you kind of implant the idea of floods into people's heads, they are really concerned about relocation, their possession, and how it affects their life as a whole. Um, next slide, please. 
Yeah, so when we also um, gauged their average score of the quantitative questions, we asked um, how likely do you think it is for a flood to occur currently in San Diego County? And people will average a score of 5.5. And when we asked within the next 10 to 15 years, they actually scored even higher at an average score of 7.5. However, when we asked them on a scale of one to 10, how likely is it that you are prepared for a flood in San Diego County? They only scored an average of 2.3. Next slide, please. So we concluded that San Diego residents strongly believe that there's actually going to be flooding between now and the next 10 to 15 years. However, they feel extremely unprepared. So this leads us to think, um, what is a way that we can kind of make people feel more motivated to become prepared and how they might take further steps to get to that stage where they might score higher um, in preparedness. And I'll hand it over to Casey to talk a little bit more about our project and our project goals. Okay, thank you, Chloe. Um, so we made a website and this is meant to be the culmination of our um, research and also our simulation. Um, and it's meant to be sort of a segue to our simulation. So this is the homepage. It's just a basic introduction and it also introduces our problem statement, um, which we've already briefly went over. Um, so after, after this, I'll put the website in the chat and I encourage you guys to read it more deeply, but it is a little bit of a spoiler for the simulation, so I don't want to go too far into it because I'm afraid I might spoil some. So this is just our team. Um, this is a very short page about that. Um, we have our project site. So this just basically um, lists all of the features that we had. Um, and I'm gonna go through it quickly because, um, but we have our pictures of the simulation um, and it just, this website is meant to house all of our findings. Um, here are our developmental goals. Um, this is just summarizing everything that we, um, all of our conclusions that we came to and also our reasoning for why we created this project. Um, and then we have our research methods, and this is actually where you can take the survey and you can see what questions we were asking and what we were looking for um, in our trials. And we have our observations at the end. So basically, this is a culmination of everything. It houses all of our discoveries. Um, and this is basically where you can find anything. And um, that's it for the website. It's very short, but it's basically just a summarization of everything that we found. Um, and that brings us to our Q&A um, before we get into the actual simulation itself. Okay, no, that's, that's beautiful. So uh, one can come to the website and access the experience. That's how that would work. So this would be also the portal for the VR experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we wanted to incorporate as much modern technology as we could uh, to kind of show the dichotomy between our issue and our current situation. And I like that you have your research methods um, on there as well. Yeah. Um, ben has a question. Yeah, so you mentioned that I think over 50% of San Diego residents had some kind of fear or had a feeling that San Diego would flood in the next 10 years, but what is the actual likelihood and have you tried comparing the two? Um, yeah, so our goal was more so of an empathetic response. Um, so we did have a very small sample size, but we wanted to get the general feeling of um, how people in this day and age feel about natural disasters. And, oh, we also chose um, Atkinson Hall, which you'll see later um, as our site for the project um, because we were very focused on UC San Diego um, with the small sample size. And we wanted to focus on somewhere that was very close to all of our hearts and somewhere that if, the, uh, hypothetically, if a natural disaster were to occur, somewhere that would affect us all. Um, Chloe, if you want to say. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, Casey. Um, building on top of that, um, 
the likelihood of San Diego flooding is actually, I believe, really likely. It was more so in our like research and project proposals that we researched how likely it is um, for San Diego or like coastal cities as a whole. But um, as of now, we've actually had some students in the survey talk about their own flooding experiences while living in San Diego. So it still is a very prevalent problem that continuously happens now when we have high tides or when we have um, more like dynamic weather. It's definitely still a very prevalent problem uh, despite people not scoring as high as whether it's likely to happen between now and the next 10 to 15 years. But um, yeah, our research definitely shows that it has happened um, in this day and age. Yeah, um, and I'll stop the share now so that we can get on to the rest of the simulation. All right, um, I'll share my screen now. Okay, so hello everyone. This is Angel and Zanza. This quarter we worked on designing a flood simulator for virtual reality. We're going to start off with an overview of our project ideation and move into how we actually designed it and then present on our research findings. So the basic idea behind our project was what if we flooded Atkinson Hall? And I'll explain how we got here. Going along with the theme of XOXR, we wanted to look at both how we can make virtual reality technology more immersive and how we can use this technology to encourage an empathic response. We came up with two problem statements. Can physically embodied motion in head-mounted display virtual reality be immersive? And can HMD VR immersivity be an empathic motivator? There's also an element of activism in our project. Um, we wanted to focus on applications, applications of VR specifically around the conversation of climate change. For this reason, we knew that we were going to base our project off of simulating a climate related disaster. The basic idea is that experiencing a climate disaster in virtual reality may be a motivational factor in activism participation. As you saw from our teammates previously, extreme flooding is a real and relevant concern of the climate crisis. We decided to use a location that's familiar to all of us here. This 3D model of Atkinson Hall was actually created by a previous QI Academy group. We loaded it into Unity, configured it for VR, and flooded it up to a standing height. Next, we'll talk about how we designed the simulation experience. So when designing the experience of our simulation, we wanted to implement physical embodiment as well as other traditional immersive elements for virtual reality. Physical embodiment is an embodied movement system with a creative feature that we want to test out, while sound design, special effects, and timing system are used to boost immersiveness all around. The method of embodiment includes two parts. The first one is natural swimming. Players need to swing their arms to navigate in the flooding zone, just like real swimming, we program the VR controllers to calculate the pushing force based on their velocity. The second element, tiptoeing, is an experimental feature that we innovated. We track the player's head-mounted display's height to, de to detect whether they're tiptoeing or not. Doing so, we can create a floating force in the game to keep players above water. We hope that the embodied experience will enhance the player's immersiveness. Moving on to other features, we have sound designs, including environmental feedback sounds and original music score. For visual, we have underwater post-processing and bubbling FX. We also implemented a timing system to set goals for players to survive. Here's a demo of our game.
study the effect of our design on players' immersiveness and empathetic motivation, we established a three-step user research with four recruited participants. We have pre-surveyed to determine their background with VR knowledge and climate change, trial to let them play the game, and a post-trial interview to receive their feedback. Here's a clip of the response to pre-survey. One time I was at a friend's apartment and I played Half-Life Elite. That was my first experience with VR. I, yeah, I really liked it. Um, I don't have one of my own. I don't think it's worth the investment. I don't think I get that much out of it. Yeah, I acknowledge that there's ongoing climate crisis that all of us are facing right now. Oh, shit's fucked. That's what I know. Humans are definitely causing it. Most climate activism that happens in the popular media is planned by companies to make people quiet about global warming. Yeah, I think it's uh, kind of urgent. Uh, I care about the environment a lot, uh, and I love nature. Uh. I'm gonna be honest, not really. Like, re really not, not for anything. Really. I think it's important to everyone, but I also think can't do much as individuals and even in groups there are still larger entities that do more damage than we can control. So the result shows that most participants have been exposed to VR, concerned about climate change, but aren't motivated to take actions yet for various reasons. So the next thing we do is to put them into the game and then do an interview with them to determine their experience with our VR and how their motivation has changed. My feet are totally hurting. I can, I can feel that when I'm sinking, my head like automatically move up, even though I know it doesn't really change anything. Like you could kind of see the edges of the room, so you knew the space after a while, but having the physical element of it really made it feel more visceral. No, I don't really know what that means. Do you feel like you're really there? No. Why not? Well, I'm not wet. It feels exhausting. I feel like I'm mentally immersed because I don't want to die. This is somewhere I'm familiar with. So it feels more realistic to think about what if this place is drowned. I think the mental immersion came along with the physical immersion. It's like as I got tired, it felt really. I know that like climate crisis is like right there, so it doesn't really add more anxiety to that. I, I don't really feel that motivated. Oh. Like you know how when you're a GTA you just like kill people? Mm -hmm. You don't like empathize with them? Like you're just trying to do something dumb the whole time? Like that's how I felt when I was playing the game. GTA doesn't make me want to kill people, so I don't think this game will make me want to save the planet. Can I be like negative here? Sure. So I know that we are on CPR 8.5 trajectory right now. And if we don't do anything right now, we're just going down that, that hill. And there are so many companies that use sustainable as their attraction for people to like buy more products. And that honestly doesn't, it doesn't change the facts that people are producing and wasting. I think if society breaks down or something, Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk are going to move to the moon or like Mars. I think right now the conversation about climate change isn't even like it's happening. It's like, like, it's not even like, how, what are we going to do to stop it? Like, there's still a debate over whether it's happening or not. Un until we stop having that conversation, nothing will really, I don't think a lot will be able to get done. Uh, yes. I think, yeah, I have to. Um, so our participants show a lot of interesting thoughts, um, but as a conclusion, overall, it seems that participants were immersed in the simulation. The embodied controls and the relationship to the environment help to achieve a sense of realism, while on the other hand, nearly all participants reported an overwhelming sense of hopelessness for the future of the planet and did not feel that a simulation was helpful in motivating them into action. In conclusion, the use of physical embodiment in VR can be incredibly immersive, but VR is unlikely to single-handedly save the planet. Participants reported positively to the use of embodied controls in terms of immersivity, but show little to no motivation to change their actions going forward. 
there was a lot of nihilism towards climate change that stemmed from very deep rooted issues that our simulation just wasn't enough to change. We maintain hope that there's hope for the future, but we acknowledge that complex problems need complex solutions. What we've done here is identify one moving part out of a myriad of factors that we will continue to explore into the future. And that concludes the end of our presentation. Thank you for watching. That was fantastic. Um, I'll lead off. I, I have to say, I'm, I'm a bit surprised by some of the comments from, uh, from the students that you interviewed. Um, I would suspect that uh, that you had that if one were to to elicit such a response or or, or create such an, an experience for someone, they may not necessarily be able to easily articulate um, you know what that effect may have sort of long term. Um, you know, I think what's very interesting. I, first of all, I think your project is absolutely fascinating, and you know. Drowning is a primal fear, and near drowning experiences are never forgotten. And so to, um, to, to try to simulate this experience and elicit a visceral response is, is essentially, in some ways, embedding in someone's memory the anxiety, the fear, the frustration that is associated with a near drowning experience. And if you tie that like you have with the possibility of of, of being in a situation like in a building that's uh, that's flooding as a result of some catastrophic event, um, you know I think that you're you're making a connection. Maybe people are not necessarily always able to articulate um, the significance of that connection, but just I think I could speak probably for many of us in this meeting that um, that even for me I think my heart rate went up. You know I mean I. I I'm, I'm looking forward to experiencing the game, and I, I, I think it's a, it was a, a really remarkable project. So I'll open it up for a couple questions. Would anyone else like to chime in? Oh uh, yeah, I I thought it was really interesting, especially in the way uh, it was able to elicit such an emotion, even. When you're actually when you're not actually there. However, that kind of brings up the question of ethics and whether or not it's all right to put someone into such a situation for the purpose of getting across a certain meaning. Because I can see how this could be used for good or for bad, because people could potentially um, maybe have some other kinds of arguments or other kinds of things they want people to believe in and they can use this very powerful fear kind of inducing um, tool to control people. So I was just wondering what, what is your take on the ethics of VR and using fear to convince people of something. Yeah, Ben, that's actually a really interesting question. I'm glad you brought it up. Um, I think our take on it is that media has a very long history of being used for both good and bad purposes, almost to the point where there's like an art to the manipulation of media. And what we're trying to do here as researchers is we're studying an emerging technology. VR is still relatively new. Um, uh, and new in the sense that it hasn't yet been mobilized to manipulate massive amounts of populations yet. What we're doing here as researchers is we're studying the effects of it in maybe manipulating people's feelings. Um, obviously here our intentions were to see if it was capable of manipulating feelings and motivation towards climate change activism. It's definitely possible that this kind of technology can be used for uh, nefarious purposes in the future. Um, but what we're doing here is we're studying the, the mechanics of it. Mm -hmm. that, that's interesting. Yeah, I think maybe as a follow-up project, what might be nice is you could hook people up to a heart rate monitor or something and just kind of see, see their heart rate go up. It'll be interesting. Yeah, I think this is a project that we 
we could expand on in, in a lot of ways. There's a lot of mm -hmm. questions that we still have to ask. Yeah, like the physiological responses. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Um... There's one other interesting element yeah. in general. There are plenty or there are multiple studies now that have been looking at how extreme experiences that might be trauma, but it might be also something very joyful, uh, get actually transcoded or encoded in your DNA. So you get to pass some of these memories down to future generations. So if done right, this actually can have quite a lasting effect what you're doing here, <laughs> which is uh, intriguing, right? And uh, in, in your case, you're uh, drawing from, I guess, a trauma type uh, element. And there's a question, can you flip that through some mechanism so you go from the trauma to the more joyful as well and back and forth that then even further amplifies this? Yeah, there's, a, there's an interesting role in like how trauma shapes our beliefs going forward. Um, I think something we'd love to explore is maybe instead of empathic motivation through trauma, maybe we do so through positive feelings and then think about what kind of experience can elicit motivation through positivity. That's definitely a question that's worth exploring. So the question is what allows you to generate the most empathy, right? Going forward, uh, motivating somebody to really step up to the plate and deal <laughs> with the immense challenges, right? The, your generation is facing. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, thank you, Professor Kuster. Um, you know, indeed, uh, you know, this is this is very primal. It gets to our sort of um, fight or flight kinds of responses. And you know, fear also exists to protect us and to uh, empower or enable us to protect those around us. Um, so there's a real um, purpose for for fear and fear response. And um, but I, I do think one thing to consider going forward, and I, I would love to see this project continue, one possibility is to build a story around that experience. So perhaps it was somewhat abstract for your participants, um, but if you were to pair it with a storyline that you know, had a coastal community um, uh, uh, you know, experience a sudden tsunami, and then you sort of observe through some kind of animation what's happening to the community or what's happening to the coastal community, and then you experience it yourself. So this way, you know, there's this, um, you know, you see the, 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 the tragedy unfold in, in a more traditional narrative sense, but then all of a sudden you become part of that experience and have to struggle to survive as, as people do when they're trapped inside flooded buildings. So um, I think this is absolutely worth exploring. I would also encourage the four of you to consider um, publication opportunities for your project. Um, there are many opportunities to, to bring this together in the form of a manuscript. Um, uh, maybe you want to expand on that a bit and uh, consider different conferences that focus on, on XR and, um, uh, and outreach and engagement, um, you know, maybe in the form of a conference paper or look at potential publication opportunity in peer review journals that focus on, on XR and and its ability to change hearts and minds. So I, I think that I'd really like to see you continue if you can, it'd be great. Thank you, thank you for all your comments, everyone. Thank you. All right, and I think we're gonna move on now to, um, to Ben and Karina, and I would ask uh, Professor Kuster if you want to introduce um, your team of Ben Liu and Karina Chen, and, and, we'll, um, and we'll hear from them and their projects as well. So, Ben and Karina have been looking jointly and then in parallel at some of the daunting challenges that we face today. Uh, one of those challenges ties into the extreme events and uh, climate change realm that we just heard about through or uh, felt about uh, uh, through our environment flooding. One of the extreme events, of course, that we're facing in California is uh, wildfires that have done tremendous damage to our environment, to our economy, to the lives and livelihoods of people, but also to the planet, because the carbon dioxide being liberated through these events is orders of magnitude larger than what we've been able to uh, mitigate through carbon offset programs and so on. So coming up with better ways to detect, understand, ultimately prevent fires, or at least 
distinguish them, as I already on said, is quite critical. So we're going to hear a little bit about sort of preliminary steps on fire tracking that the team has looked at. And then Ben also has been looking at some of the other challenges related to how do we power our planet going forward? How do we generate the energy <laughs> that really ultimately is needed to sustain us? And again, ideally without creating uh, massive carbon also, um, uh, footprints. Um, and as you're all aware, uh, things look pretty daunting right now, in particular with some of the recent crises that have evolved and the outputs uh, being generated of uh, climate change accelerating. Okay, so I'll hand it off uh, to Ben, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, Professor Guster. So let me share my screen. So I decided to research the practicality of wave energy converters because given just looking at the, the past two presentations, something that really struck me was the nihilism that a lot of students have, how they think that it's just not possible for activism and nothing can be done unless there is dialogue. So I think taking a different approach, what if technology to solve this instead of purely um, people power? Because I think the two have to go hand in hand. The people have to be motivated to use certain technologies and then certain technologies have to be developed in the first place. So this brings me to why wave energy converters when there are so many other forms of green energy. Well, the, the first thing that I thought of was that waves have higher power density than wind and solar energy, which means that for a given area, you can collect more power using waves. And the second is that our planet, the surface of it is mostly water. And so if you think about it, if, we, if only we could have a reliable source of wave energy, then we could potentially have a huge um, scale. We could put these things everywhere in the oceans, and there's not a lot of people living around the oceans. So unlike wind turbines and solar panels, they wouldn't be a nuisance, or they wouldn't have noise problems, or just kind of be ugly and people would complain. So that was my motivation. And I started researching different types of wave energy converters and also different locations. So first I wanna talk about offshore versus nearshore locations. Here you see a map of California with the population densities, red being higher. And you notice that the majority of human populations seem to be clustered along the shorelines. So this, what this means is that generators, the, there would be a pro in which they are closer to the end users. So you can easily transport the energy generated to the people who use them. However, on the other hand, because they are also closer to humans, some people might be more resistant to adopting certain these technologies, sometimes because they're visual nuisances or noise, and also because the impact on quite often very sensitive coastal environments. On the other hand, the advantages of offshore wave energy collectors is that there is more scalability. If you take a strip of area, say, one kilometer wide, and you run this down this coastline, which would be the, the amount of area that we could use for near shore wave energy collectors, it wouldn't be a lot compared to this entire chunk of ocean. So clearly offshore wave energy collectors have more potential to scale. And also offshore waves tend to be bigger. So you also have more powerful waves. And because of that, I concluded that offshore wave energy collectors have more future. And so if we really are to make practical 
we have energy collectors to help save the environment, we should probably focus on offshores. Next, I examined the types of wave energy collectors. Um, so I read this paper um, that surveyed the most common types used in the UK. And there are three types. One of them is called the point absorber, which is kind of like a buoy that can bob up and down. So when the wave pushes it up, there's a string attached to it and it can pull up and down and power a generator. The second one here, this is the palamist, it's called an attenuator. So it has these joints here that you can see. And when the waves um, kind of shake this thing around, the joints, the, at the bending at the joints allows energy to be generated. And lastly, this type is called the terminator, where the wave runs into it and it stops the wave and takes that energy. So the criteria to, to make a practical wave energy ge generator that can actually be implemented is it has to be cheap and easy to make and maintain. Otherwise, people wouldn't use them and there wouldn't be any point in developing them to save the planet. So looking at the Terminator first, I thought because it's taking the full brunt of the wave and the wave is crashing into it, it would have to um, absorb a lot of energy and it would have to stand up to all these corrosive ocean environments. So I concluded that the Terminator probably isn't the best amount, the best way. And in addition, you can see how it needs a lot of these concrete support structures in order to stand up to the full brunt of the waves. While these, these just kind of ride along, so they don't have to go against it. And therefore it is easier to create and maintain because you don't need so much material to ensure the structural integrity of it. Now, going along with, so after concluding that offshore and point, point source and attenuator types are to have more future, I kind of look at the problems associated with these two, especially the problems associated with offshore. Because for an offshore wave energy collector, the, it is located very far away from the end user. So then you would either have to run a very long power line, kind of like this, or you could um, have like a lot of batteries and slowly move it away, which is kind of the second of which was what I was thinking about. Because maintaining these underlying cables is going to be very difficult, especially when you have a lot of, when you scale it up and you have a lot of them everywhere. You don't want to have cables everywhere because then the entire ocean would just be having like, you have, you'd have cables dangling down here, 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 which would be a problem to both maintain and to make in the first place. So then I proposed a solution where what if we could use an autonomous ship with batteries on it? And so instead of having cables, we can have this battery power carrying ship charge up when it's near the generator and then carry it to somewhere farther away, maybe like a station. And then from there on, we can have centralized cables or we can use it on the spot. Like the stations themselves can be mobile too. So we are focusing on uh, flexibility. We want uh, to be able to place these anywhere we want, place them where the wave energy at the moment is greater or be able to move these away from places where there might be a storm and the waves might be destructive instead of um, being, act being useful for generating energy. However, this proposed situation solution brings on additional problems. We would have to optimize the path of these automated ships because even the stations are moving. So and we also need to break even in a reasonable amount of time. So 
I wanted to analyze whether or not this is this solution is worth pursuing. So I made some initial calculations based off of this thing called the Wave Glider, which is made by a company called Liquid Robotics. And it is passively powered by waves to transport sensors. However, I thought of what if we could replace these sensors with batteries and use these to transport energy from wave energy collectors offshore to end users. So the results of my calculations were that for every kilometer that the WC, the wave energy collector unit is located away from the station or away from the end user, we would need three to eight battery carrying wave gliders. So this is assuming that its full capacity is loaded up with batteries and not other sensors. So you would need this many to maintain a constant uh, power of 750 kilowatts, which for reference would be enough power to, to power um, several microwaves. However, this is going to be very expensive. So in the end, I kind of concluded that it's not very possible with the current technology. So any follow-up questions would be whether or not this is worth pursuing in the first place, because there are a myriad of other green energy, such as solar and wind, which although they might not have the same power density as ocean waves, they might just be easier to implement and therefore they will actually be used instead of just be some kind of theoretical thing. And also, there's also the question of, should we really fill the oceans with these uh, wave energy collectors rather than to just preserve the natural environment of the ocean? So in conclusion, that I think it's not worth pursuing because of its, because it doesn't really have any immediate benefit in either the short term or the long term that I can see. And I came to this conclusion by researching existing wave energy collector mod types and also comparing and contrasting offshore versus near shore locations. So is there any questions? Thank you, Ben. We'll let anyone chime in if they'd like, and and uh, we don't want to um, take too much time away from Karina. We can try to end close to the four o'clock hour. And um, excellent presentation. I I think it would be very. Um, I think you would very much enjoy an opportunity at some point to to attend an ocean energy conference. It's really incredible when you go to some of these um, meetings, and there are literally hundreds of people there that are very much involved in the innovation game, trying to think about um, you know, what might work or what does work or what could work in the ocean environment in terms of um, harnessing energy, transporting energy. And you know, every, I, I used to go to about two of them a year. And um, you know, I usually come home with my head spinning, <laughs> seeing so many interesting um, ways that people are, are uh, you know, experimenting with different technologies and um, so that's something that you should definitely think about, Ben. If you're if you're you know have an ongoing interest in in this arena, there there are ample opportunities to see what's going on in the marine technology community. Um, but uh, excellent presentation. If anyone would like to to make a comment um, or a question, go right ahead. See, from the academic perspective, I almost would turn your conclusion around and says, so yes, you have established there's a tremendous amount of energy right that can be harvested. There's simply no good way to do that effectively, efficiently, uh, without causing environmental damage and so on right now. But that means there's tremendous opportunity, right, for future research. And the DOE just funded a massive ape energy test site in Oahu, Hawaii, to sort of explore the interaction between these different devices, the environment, uh, how energy can be mm -hmm. extracted, and that entire interplay. Um, so I would from my perspective, slightly shift your conclusion towards this is really hard, 
but that means there are a lot of opportunities, right, to be pursued. Yeah, one thing I actually forgot to mention, uh, thank you, Professor Kuster. One thing I forgot to mention is that this number I came up with, I found was actually primarily limited by the energy density of batteries. And after some thinking, I realized that if battery energy were to increase, it would also open the doors for a lot of other uh, green energy applications, which potentially could make this obsolete. That's the so whole just something to think about. Topic. That's what, uh, there's a tremendous amount of research invested in um, improving battery performance. And uh, um, it's definitely uh, would open up so many different other um, areas of, of, of research and, and exploration as well. So um, yeah, very interesting. Yeah, thank you. And I, I will hand it over to Karina. Okay, uh, let me share my screen. Okay, so I decided to do my project on wildfire spread, just cause like wildfires have been such a big, like there's been so many occurrences of them and they spread really fast and they get really big, really fast. So I decided to look at this for my project. Um, okay, so I, I had two um, parts to it. So the first part was image analysis which I did using MATLAB's image processing toolbox. And the second part was just looking at a data set um, that I found on Kaggle, um, where I did some exploratory data analysis and some basic machine learning. Okay, so these are the images that I looked at. Um, it's a sequence of images taken and you can tell that like the fire area is really distinct here. So I know that like it's not mo the majority of the time it's not going to be like that, but for the purposes of this project, I just chose to um, look at images with a well-defined fire area. Um, so first, I isolated the wildfire area. I did this uh, using the color thresholder tool. So basically, I tried to only get the colors in the image that were red, orange, yellow. Um, and so that gave me this image, oh, which is in binary with the white part representing the part that I want. Um, but then you can see that there's like some noise here and here because of like the colors and like the grass and the logo um, of PG and E. So I use a threshold value to get rid of the excess noise. So that's this image here. And then next I looked at um, the edges of each of the wildfire area. So first I tried to like look at like the original image and then get the edge from that, but that didn't work because there were too, too many other things in the image, like the holes and everything. So I just did it on the binary images. Okay, and then next I got a composite um, of all of the binary images. So like the area of the wildfire here is highlighted in green. Um, so then I calculated the number of pixels, the white pixels, which represent the parts that were burned, and then the total pixels based on the dimensions of the picture, and then to get the ratio or the percent of area, percentage of area burned. Um, so this was all that I was able to do for this part of it. Um, but for the next part, um, I got a data set from Kaggle, basically just wildfires from like 2013 to 2020. And then I, so this is the data frame. I cleaned, or I only kept a few of the columns that I was looking at. Um, so here you can see like the different counties that the wildfire occurred in. So, and then here um, I took the first four rows of the data frame and then got the number of wildfires in each um, year. And then this one just represents like, um, it just has all the counties and then the number of times they had wildfires in, all, in the whole time span. And then so this one, 
um, I was able to get the distance between each county. Um, so like the lighter orangish color represents like a farther distance and then darker is closer. So you can see like there's a diagonal line here because it's comparing it to itself. So it's gonna be zero distance. Um, and then for like the machine learning part, I wanted to look at if, um, well, I chose to look at Los Angeles specifically, but I wanted to like look at this question. If we know a wildfire happened on a certain day in a certain city, will there be a wildfire in LA in one to three days or different day increments? Um, so I basically classified each, um, each one by finding the difference between the start times. So I gave each one a class number um, for each day increment from zero to three. And then I basically ran a model and then, or like I ran a test on different models to see which one was the best. And it, I got that the extra trees classifier scored the highest in general. Um, yeah, um, and I used different uh, random set of training and testing data for each run. So each run would give me different output, but generally this one was always the best. And this is the confusion matrix of the data. So this is like the correct one. And then this is the predicted. So you can see that like the, it's pretty accurate. And there's only like a few that are not correct. And they're generally pretty close. So yeah, in conclusion, um, I have a lot of things that I could continue doing for this project. Um, so for the images, I only got like the pixels, but if I were able to calculate the amount of real life area that each pixel represents, then because of the timestamps on each image, I could get like the speed and the distance travel of the fire. Um, this part would be kind of difficult because like it's hard to generalize, generalize it. Um, to like different images and also because of like the depth it's kind of hard to calculate um and then another thing i could do is refine the wildfire detection on less prominent wildfire images so like if they if the fire area wasn't well defined and there was like just smoke or something or if it was covered by something else then my model wouldn't work and then for the data machine learning model, I can improve it by adding more variables to have a more accurate model. And that's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Karina. Does, uh, does anyone have any questions? Really, a, a number of different um, overlapping studies. Any one of these you could expand and, and, and develop further if, um, you know, if you continue to have interest in um, in this particular domain. Um, it's obviously highly relevant research. And I was curious um, when, you know, in, it, the image, image analysis, is it possible to interpret or deduce fire intensity or fire temperature from those image data? And is it also possible to deduce or identify um, fuel type uh, based on the kind of the, the the characteristics of the fire as as observed in the image. I don't know if that was necessarily the focus, but I think that that's an interesting topic potentially. In there. Yeah. Um. I yeah. I didn't like think about that too much. Um. Because I think like for the intensity, I would like my mind first goes to like the color, but if it's a, like I said, like if there's smoke or something that dims the color or like grays it out, kind of, it's kind of hard to tell. So I feel like to do that, you have to have like a much more advanced model. So, so both of you did something uh, very interesting and uh, quite, quite challenging by going from a very narrowly defined project uh, to an approach to really say, well, let, let us understand the problem domain first, right? Mm -hmm. Takes the overall challenge at hand.
and figure out how to possibly generate traction within a domain that is massively complex, right? And what you've been looking at is um, to say, well, assuming we can spot a fire, we identify it's burning, how do we actually track it? And that's not easy because in many instances, the fire is actually not visible. It's the flu, right? It's a part of the signal that you can see. But once you have that, right, how do you establish the direction of the burn, uh, the velocity, uh, the overall biomass consumed and so on? And so what both of you have been doing, uh, which I think is important as a fundamental building block for more advanced research, is to try to get a better grasp right, of what are the challenges there and how do you start packing away at them um, to develop uh, your own little niche. Excellent. Thank you, Falco. Um, any other questions for Karina? Well, we're coming up at the, at the top of the hour here. Um, this has been a really incredible hour. <laughs> I've been very impressed and uh, you know, just uh, you know, looking forward to actually following up um, with, with you on, on some of these projects because I, I really feel that some of them have a life beyond this course. And um, I want to go ahead and kind of uh, bring this to a close. Of course, uh, first, Firstly, thanking uh, Dr. Falco Kuster and Trish Stone for serving as mentors. Um, I'm, I'm sure you had a great experience working with both of them, and I hope those relationships will continue. And a farewell to Joyce Wong, who is really responsible for the success of this program at Qualcomm Institute, and really want to thank her for her efforts. Um, and for all of you for bringing your game. Um, you know, this is, again, your time. Uh, this is, <laughs> you're, you're the change makers. And, um, you know, take that passion beyond campus and, and out into the real world and, and, um, and do great things. And in the short term, uh, all of you, um, best of luck next week for finals. And hopefully you all have a restful, productive, and, and even festive spring break. Um, and uh, please stay in touch. Um, thank you all. And, and I'll, I'll bring our meeting to a close. Thank you. And thank you, everyone. Thank you. Well done, everyone. Take care.